In this video, we're going to cover the intermediate value theorem, Rolle's theorem, and the mean value theorem. A theorem will say, if something something, then something something. So the if part is saying, if these conditions are satisfied, the then part of the statement is saying what the conclusion of the theorem is. The way that the word theory is used in actual science and actual mathematics is not the same as the way the word theory is used in society or in the media. In science, a theory is a system of axioms and theorems that have already been proven, already been established. As long as the hypothesis are satisfied, the conclusions definitely follow. This is proven, it's true, and it's part of, say, in, in the case of our class, it's the whole theory of calculus is built up of a bunch of theorems. The important takeaway here is that a theorem is not some theoretical thing. It's not some flighty thing that we're saying, you know, might be true. It is true. It has been proven. So in order for you to use a theorem, what you need to do, which I'm calling a mini proof because yes, it's a proof, but um, it's not extensive proof that you might do in some higher mathematics or graduate classes. What you do is you need to establish that the hypothesis actually do hold in your situation with your problem specifically. Okay, so if it says, if the function is continuous, then blah, blah, blah. You need to say, why is your function continuous? You need to establish that this theorem does apply to your or situation. In the example using continuity, you can say something like, oh, well, my function is cosine. And we know that sine and cosine are both continuous on the whole real line. That's something that we have from um, the beginning of the class, the first couple of videos, I forget the number. So that's the first step. So the second step would be to write another sentence stating how the conclusions apply to your problem and specifically like what are the consequences of these conclusions of the theorem for your particular situation. The the first theorem we're going to cover is the intermediate value theorem. The intermediate value theorem says if the function is continuous on an interval that is specifically of this type where it's a comma b with a and b included with the square brackets, that is the hypothesis here. Then for all of the heights in between f of a and f of b, there exists some x equals c value in between a and b that's not c cannot be equal to a and c cannot be equal to b such that f of c is equal to h. Okay, that sounded like jargon. Let's look at an actual picture and see what's going on here. So we have an interval from a to b with a and b included. In order to get from x equals a to x equals b with a continuous function, so I can't pick this pen up off from the iPad, I have to go through the height of h. That is what the intermediate value theorem is saying. Now the function could look a little bit differently. It could, if you want, uh, go up and then come down. It could come down and then go up, but it doesn't matter how you draw this function. If it is continuous on the closed interval, including a and including b, then you absolutely must go through all intermediate heights between f of a and f of b. And the x value where that height is attained is called x equals c. This is true because if it's continuous, then you can't have any vertical asymptotes, you can't have any uh, jumps in the function. If it's continuous, it will hit every single height height in between f of a and f of b. We can use the theorem to deduce certain things like that this polynomial equals zero has a solution. If you had like a squared polynomial or a quadratic is equal to zero, there's only two options there, which is either you factor the quadratic and you set each term equal to zero and you solve for x, or you use the quadratic formula, okay? The reason why we can't do that here is because this polynomial is just way too ridiculously large. A seventh degree polynomial could be factored into seven factors, which would be just too hard to figure out here. And a seventh degree polynomial, there's no like seventh degree version of the quadratic formula. So this is why we actually need to use a theorem in order to establish this. We won't actually find the value of x, but if we could just figure out that this function has a solution at all, that would be at least a start to the problem. This seventh degree polynomial is our f of x. Now in our case, what we need to say is that f of x is a polynomial, and we know from earlier in the course that polynomials are continuous everywhere. We haven't established which interval we're talking about. 
remember that intermediate value theorem requires that we're working on an interval with a and b included as endpoints. Now what that a and b is is not really clear at this point, but we do know that the function is continuous. Our strategy here in order to establish that a function is equal to zero is to say, well, zero could be one of those intermediate heights. If, if we could just establish that f of x goes through a negative height and f of x goes through like some positive height, then zero would be the intermediate height. And we could say that the theorem says that the intermediate height of zero is definitely attained at some x value. Therefore, the function equals zero has a solution. The height of the function at x equals zero is a negative number. Let's try another one. Let's say x equals one. Just pick easy numbers that are easy to do by hand if x is equal to one and we get positive four. So it looks like we're going to apply the intermediate value theorem on the interval between x equals zero and x equals one. So now what we need to do is write down a sentence that says how the conclusions of the intermediate value theorem are impacting our problem. Okay, since the height of the function is negative at x equals zero and positive at x equals one. That means that the so-called intermediate height of h equals zero must be attained at some x value in the interval from zero to one. That is the conclusion of the intermediate value theorem. And that's it, we are done. We are done the problem, we are done the proof. It's always nice if you want to, as sort of an extra part, is to draw some kind of a picture so you have some kind of an idea of what the heck is going on here. We've got some sort of polynomial function, which is is clearly continuous because all polynomials are continuous everywhere. And we know that the height of the function at x equals zero is negative 12. The height of the function at x equals one is positive four. So therefore it must at some point go through the intermediate height of, of a height of zero, which means that this polynomial does have a solution of equaling zero. Now, I don't actually know where that x value is located. All I know is that the x value is somewhere in between x equals zero and x equals one. We're just proving existence in this proof. The next theorem is called Rolle's theorem. Rolle's theorem has a bit more in terms of the hypothesis here. In addition to being continuous on AB with AB included, you also have to be differentiable on the interval without AB included. Remember that you can't be differentiable if you're at the edge of a graph, if you're at a kink in the graph, or if you're at the end point of an interval. So that's why the endpoints are not included for differentiability. And you also have to have the height of the function at A equal to the height of the function at B. Okay, so Rolle's theorem really has three different parts to the hypothesis, the continuous, the differentiable, and the f of A is equal to f of B. Then the conclusion of the theorem is that there must exist some C value in between A and B where f prime of C is equal to zero. As usual, it kind of sounds like jargon when you just read it out loud. Let's take a look at a picture. The function that I draw in between these two points has to be continuous and differentiable according to the hypothesis of the theorem. The continuous part means that there's going to be no holes, no asymptotes, it has to be defined everywhere, it can't run off to infinity, and the differentiable part means that as I draw this function, I better not draw any kinks because it does have to be differentiable. What the conclusion is is that there must exist some x equals c value in between a and b where the first derivative is equal to zero. Of course, that means that the slope of the tangent line is equal to zero. If I'm going to draw a function that is continuous and differentiable, there is no way I could draw that graph without somewhere the first derivative being equal to zero. You could just try it out. <laughs> Here's a different path that's continuous and differentiable. It's continuous and differentiable here. And you can see there's a couple different points where the first derivative is equal to zero. One of the important things about Rolle's theorem, and really any theorem, actually intermediate value theorem as well, is that when it says there exists some c value in between a and b, it's just saying like there has to exist at least one point where the first derivative is equal to zero. There could be more, but at the very least the Rolle's theorem establishes that there has to exist at least one point where the first derivative is equal to zero. We are going to prove that this function 2x plus cosine crosses the x-axis exactly once in the domain from negative infinity to positive infinity. Rolle's theorem applies on an interval a, b, has to be continuous 
this, including the endpoints, differentiable not including the endpoints. So this interval that's given to us is not the interval where we're applying Rolle's theorem. We have to figure out the interval and the context ourselves, okay? What we're going to do is a proof by contradiction here. Let's say the opposite of what we're being asked. This says prove that it crosses exactly once. What you're saying is that it can't be twice, it can't be three times, okay? So let's assume that it does cross at least twice and show that this is impossible. So let's assume that there are two x values where it crosses the axis. f of x1 is equal to 0 and f of x2 is equal to 0. We're trying to prove that it actually crosses only once. So somehow assuming that it crosses twice will lead us to a contradiction. Since uh, the function that we're dealing with here uh, is a polynomial plus a cosine function, it is continuous and differentiable everywhere. So Rolle's theorem will apply on any interval. And the interval that is valid here or applicable here is from x1 to x2. In other words, from the first crossing point to the second crossing point. Okay, so on this interval, it's continuous, it's differentiable, and also, remember this, the crucial thing about Rolle's theorem is that you have to have the height of the function at the first point equal to the height of the function at the second point. We've got f of x1 is equal to 0 because that's the first crossing point, and f of x2 equal to 0 as well. So 0 is equal to 0, so the height of the function at both points is equal to 0. According to Rolle's theorem, this implies that there must be some c value in between x1 and x2 so that the first derivative is equal to zero. But we're dealing with 2x plus cosine. We know what the derivative of that is. Think about it. The range of the sine function is from negative 1 to positive 1. Then you add plus 2, which means that the range is from 1 to 3. There is no way that this first derivative could ever be equal to zero. This is a classic proof by contradiction. If Rolle's theorem is giving us something that's impossible, we know Rolle's theorem is correct. So it must be our assumptions that are flawed. So f of x cannot cross more than twice, then at most the function would cross one time. So now we're down to either one or zero as the number of times it crosses the axis. Now to establish that it crosses, let's use the intermediate value theorem. If we plug in pi over 2 and negative pi over 2, we will get a positive number and a negative number, and so therefore it must hit the axis at some point in between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And there we go. That is the end of the proof. So just to review what the heck happened here, what we did was in the first part, we used Rolle's theorem in order to say that if it crosses more than twice, that's impossible. So if it can't cross more than twice, then either it doesn't cross at all or it crosses exactly once, okay? And then for the second part, we use the intermediate value theorem in order to say, yes, it does cross the axis at some point, okay? So between the two, if it does cross at some point and it can't cross more than twice, the only logical thing left over is that it must cross exactly one time in between negative pi over two and pi over two. Remember, intermediate value theorem, like we were saying, earlier just says that there would be some crossing point on the axis. That doesn't mean that there couldn't be many more. So the intermediate value theorem is required in order to say that it crosses the axis, but the intermediate value theorem does not mean that it couldn't just hit the axis a bunch of times, okay? Hitting more than twice, we need Rolle's theorem. We need a different theorem in order to establish that. And the final theorem is the mean value theorem. The hypothesis is that it's continuous on the interval including a and b and differentiable on the interval not including the endpoints a and b. So as long as those two things are true, then the conclusion is that there must exist some x equals c value in between a and b such that the slope of the tangent line at x equals c is equal to the slope of the secant line between x equals a and x equals b. Let's look at a picture to understand what this is saying. So in the mean value theorem, we do not necessarily have that f of a is equal to f of b. And now we're going to draw some sort of function in between here that's continuous and differentiable. At some point, the slope of the secant line in between a and b must at some point agree with the slope of the tangent line on the function. Similar to the other couple of theorems, this just says there must exist some c value value in between a and b. It could be that there are multiple values, like you can see like right here, the slope of the tangent agrees with the slope of the secant, and also right here, the slope of the tangent agrees with the slope of the secant. If I had drawn a different function that squiggles in a different way, maybe I could
could just draw one that is only has one C value or maybe with a couple more bumps, I could find um, a continuous differentiable function that has, you know, five different values where the slope of the tangent is equal to the slope of the secant, okay? But the mean value theorem says some C value, there could be three of them, there could be five of them, but at the very least there has to exist at least one C value where the slope of the tangent is equal to the slope of the secant. Okay, let's look at a problem here. Is it possible that a continuous differentiable function could satisfy the following properties? f of 3 is equal to negative 2, f of 5 is equal to 6, and f prime of x is less than or equal to 3 for all x values. Let's look at a picture. We've got f of 3 is negative 2, f of 5 is 6 up here, and we're looking at something that's continuous and differentiable. So the mean value theorem definitely does apply here because it's just saying that it's continuous and differentiable. So the hypothesis have already been established for us. Okay, so let's just write down what the mean value theorem says. There must be some point in between x equals 3 and x equals 5 so that the slope of the tangent at x equals c matches up is equal to the slope of the secant between x equals 3 and x equals 5. Okay, but we actually have values for these. I know that f of 5 is equal to 6. I know that f of 3 is equal to negative 2. And what I get is f prime of c using the mean value theorem. There must exist some x value where f prime of c is equal to 4. Okay, but the original problem says f prime is less than or equal to 3. So when it asks, is it possible for a continuous differentiable function to satisfy these properties? No, 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 no. It's not possible because if you have f of 3 is equal to negative 2 and f of 5 is equal to 6, and it's continuous differentiable, you can use the mean value theorem to say that there must exist an f prime of c that's equal to 4. So clearly the f primes cannot all be less than 3 because we just showed that one of them is definitely equal to 4 by the mean value theorem.